International Forum on One Korea 2022 will begin shortly. Please take your seat, and to prevent the spread of COVID-19, please keep your mask on throughout the event. We will start the forum at 10.05, so please turn off your smartphone or mute your smartphone for the smooth operation of this meaningful forum today. For today's forum, simultaneous interpretation is being provided. If you see the top of the receiver, you can turn on the receiver and please turn to channel 1 for Korean and channel 2 for English. International Forum on One Korea 2022 will begin shortly and the representatives from the organizers will come in to declare open the International Forum on One Korea 2022.
Ladies and gentlemen, International Forum on One Korea 2022 will begin shortly. Dr. Hyun Jin Moon, the chairman of the Global Peace Foundation and the co-organizers co -organizers are arriving. Please give them a warm round of applause. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the leaders of all walks of life who joined the International Forum on One Korea 2022 today, and to the overseas participants from all over the world despite your busy schedule. I am Park Jong Chun, the Secretary General of the Actions for Korea United, and I will be MC for this historic International Forum today. This forum has been co-organized by the Global Peace Foundation and representative civic society organizations, including Actions for Korea United, Korean Parliamentarian Society, Korean Senior Citizens Association, Korean National Police Veterans Association, Federation of Artistic Cultural Organizations of Korea, and Leaders for Alliance for Korea Unification, and One Korea Foundation U.S. with the sponsorship of the Ministry of Unification and the Peaceful Unification Advisory Council. So, the International Forum on One Korea, which began in July 2016, marks its 19th anniversary today, and it has led to consensus and participation not only in Korea but also globally for the creation of a shared value of a free and unified Korea centering on the Korean dream. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all the participants and speakers at home and abroad who attended to gather insights and wisdom despite the busy schedule. In addition, we would like to thank the viewers in Korea and around the world who are participating online. Today's forum will be a meaningful venue to explore the strategic direction of peace and unification on the Korean Peninsula in the wake of an increasing tension under the theme of Free and Unified Korea, a catalyst for regional and global peace and development. Now, uh, let's give us a quick round of applause to start the forum officially. Now, let's watch the pro promotional video of the International Forum on One Korea, which has been held since 2016 and marks its 19th anniversary today. On the video, you can appreciate the purpose and activities of the forum.
광복 77주년을 맞은 이곳에서 2022 원코리아 국제 포럼을 개최합니다. 2016년 미국 원코리아 국제 포럼을 시작으로 올해로 19회째를 맞이한 세계 최대 규모의 한반도 평화 통일을 위한 논의의 장. 지금 미중 패권 전쟁 격화와 우크라이나 전쟁 등 엄중한 국제 정세 속에서 한반도는 중대한 역사적 전환점에 서 있습니다. 불안정한 정세 속에서 국내외 저명한 학자, 정치, 언론의 시민사회 지도자들은 다시 한번 원코리아 국제 포럼에 모였습니다. 2022 원코리아 국제 포럼은 한반도 통일의 평화적 기회를 발견하기 위해 열띤 논의를 펼쳐나갈 것입니다. 첫 번째 세션, 문현진 글로벌 피스 재단 세계의장의 기조연설. 자유통일 한국, 동북아 및 세계 평화 번영의 기폭제를 주제로 한 전체 회의. 두 번째 세션, 평화와 안보. 세 번째 세션, 경제. 네 번째 세션, 인권. 원코리아 국제 포럼의 모든 회의는 이곳 페어몬트 앰베서더 호텔에서 오프라인으로 진행되고 유튜브, 줌으로 전 세계 온라인 생중계됩니다. 널리 인간을 이롭게, 홍익 인간 이상을 실현하고 자유롭고 통일된 한반도를 향한 구체적 로드맵 모색을 위한 2022 원코리아 국제 포럼. 지금 그 문을 열겠습니다. Be on applause for Dr. Benjamin Preston Moon, please. Thank you. And also, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Chun Suk Moon, Chairman of Peace Women, who has spread out the value of family love. Big round of applause, please, expressing gratitude. I'd like to introduce to you Honorable Jong Ga Lee, Standing Chairman of Korean Council for Reconciliation and Cooperation, former five term uh, lawmaker at the National Assembly of Korea. And also, I'd like to introduce to you Honorable Moon Kyo Hong. Lawmaker at the National Assembly of Korea. I'd like to introduce to you Mr. James Flynn, International President of Global Peace Foundation. A big round of applause, please. I'd like to introduce to you a three term lawmaker. And also the representative, another co-host of the forum, um, Mr. Kim Dong-ju, who is the um, president of Leaders Alliance for Korean Unification. Also, I'd like to introduce you, a lawmaker and standing chair of uh, AKU, Mr. Kim chung -hun. And also, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Chairman Yong and Kim, who is the head of the uh, Korea Veterans Association, representing 1.5 million Korea. And also, 
I'd like to introduce to you um, Chairman Yi Bum Hum, who is the head of the Federation of Artistic and Cultural Organization of Korea. Also, I'll introduce to you co-chairs of AKU, Mrs. Sain Tech. Co-chair, Mr. Antonio. And Yu Gyeonggi. Thank you. Also, I'd introduce to you who is uh, leading 8.5 million ethnic Koreans living abroad as the head of the the Korean Members Association of the U.S., uh, Mr. Pyong Ji Kim. And also, I'd like to introduce you to Chairman Richard Lee, who is the President of Alliance for Korea United, USA. I'd like to introduce to you Chairman Chang Man Soon, who will be presenting a 10 uh, million separate family uh, committee. Also, I'd like to introduce to you all uh, the uh, lawmakers. We have lawmaker Yu Yong Gun, a beer out of pass, please. We have a uh, lawmaker also a uh, Chebongu. And also, we have lawmaker Hwang Inja. I'd like to introduce to you former chairman of Tongil Group, Mr. Kwak Jong An. I'd like to introduce to you co representative of Buddhist monk Yang Dam. Big round of applause, please. I'd like to introduce to you the chair, Park Jong Su, who is the head of the Economic Cooperation Committee in the presidential office. And also, I'd like to introduce to you. Secretary General of the um, Korean Office of the International People to People, Mr. H. Wan. Also, I would like to introduce you International uh, President, Mr. Park Jin Man of Family Keys Organization. And also, I'd like to introduce to you uh, the Chairman, Mr. Che Jung Jin. And also, I'd like to introduce to you International. President of Global Peace Women. I'd like to introduce to you Honorable Consul, uh, Mr. Vombatani from Cambodia. I would like to ask for understanding uh, that I did not introduce to all the members and leaders of eight different uh, co-host institutions and uh, organizations, but please give them a VR class for those whose names has not been introduced to you. Thank you. Now, let me move on to the opening addresses. On behalf of the co-organizers, co two speakers will give opening addresses. First of all, Mr. Kim chung won co-chair of Actions for Korea United, Chairman Kim served, is also serving as the Secretary General of the Korean Elementary and Society. Please give him a big hand. Sincerely welcome all of you who participated in today's international forum, Korean Korea 2022, uh, 2022 uh, to seek unification of the Korean uh, Peninsula and the world peace. Uh, unification of Korean Peninsula and the world peace. I would also like to thank Chairman Min Hyun Jin and the Chairman Kim Lin uh, of TPF. Uh, for the time's sake, I would like to give my address in Korea in Korean from now on. I sincerely 
welcome and thank all the participants who have gathered for the 2022 International Forum on One Korea to commemorate the 77th anniversary of liberation and to seek ways to realize world peace through unification of the Korean Peninsula. This year's theme is Free and Unified Korea, a catalyst for peace and prosperity in Northeast Asia and world. I hope uh, we can explore a lot of ways and come to a fruitful research of the discussions. In today's world, we are experiencing a very unstable situation with numerous problems, including the corona pandemic, the Ukraine war, climate change, and the global economic recession. In addition, the world economy is suffering from food shortages and energy supply disruptions due to the war in Ukraine. Also, North Korea is strengthening its nuclear bombs, intercontinental ballistic research, and SLBM capabilities. If left unchecked, the Korean Peninsula will turn into a flashpoint, which has the potential to lead to the catastrophe of the Third World War. However, if permanent peace is achieved on the Korean Peninsula and peace in the global village is established, our peace, our world will be safer. However, North Korea is refusing to come to the negotiating table. Therefore, if the world truly wishes for a denuclearization of North Korea, I think we need to seek another way. I believe the peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula will be the surest way to this end. And what will be the conditions for peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula? The first condition is that 80 million Korean people need to aspire to unification and there should be support by powerful countries surrounding the Korean Peninsula. AKU and civic society organizations and a lot of people have worked hard for unification of the Korean Peninsula. What each Important is to garner support from powerful countries surrounding the Korean Peninsula. The four major countries that have been involved in the division of the Korean Peninsula need to feel the moral responsibility to work for the unification of the Korean Peninsula. I, if the consensus on the need for unification is achieved by these four major countries. I believe the peace in Northeast Asia can be achieved. The Korean War and the Armistice Agreement and the division of the Korean Peninsula and other major events on the Korean Peninsula have all been affected by the interest of the or major powers. So I believe the cooperation and understanding of those countries is very critical today. The Korean people aspire to the peace on the Korean Peninsula. I hope the great powers, four powers, understand these aspirations and cooperate for the unification of the two Koreas. Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to hearing your wisdom and insight for the unification of the Korean Peninsula and world peace today. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, for sharing the importance of international cooperation to realize a free and unified Korea. Please give him a big round of applause. Please give him a big hand. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Jim Flynn, International President of the Global Peace Foundation, will give a speech. Founded in 2009, the Global Peace Foundation is a UN special advisory group operating in 24 countries around the world to realize global peace and free and a unified Korea with the vision of one family under God. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Global Peace Foundation and together with our co-conveners and partners, welcome to today's very meaningful international forum on One Korea. We appreciate all who are participating both here in Seoul, as well as connecting virtually from around the world. 
Special thanks to the distinguished scholars, policy experts, and government officials who are joining today to share their important perspectives. We are grateful that key leaders are participating in this session from Korea, United States, Japan, China, India, Indonesia, Thailand, and Mongolia. Indicative of the fact that resolving the division of the Korean Peninsula is a significant priority, not only for Koreans, but indeed for the region and entire world. I would like to also especially appreciate our hosts for these convenings, Dr. Hyunjin Preston Moon, founder and chairman of the Global Peace Foundation and author of the award-winning book, Korean Dream, as well as Dr. Jun Suk Moon, co-founder of the Global Peace Foundation and chairwoman of Global Peace Women. As we all know, our world today is facing significant challenges. Russia's ongoing war of aggression against Ukraine and its people has caused enormous destruction, suffering, and loss of life with major geopolitical, economic, and social ramifications globally. And with increasingly intense US-China relations and ongoing urgent security concerns due to North Korea's nuclear ambitions and egregious human rights violations, Northeast Asia is a particularly critical flashpoint. Decades of international pressure and diplomatic efforts have failed to break the vicious cycle of negotiations, concessions, and provocations. This is clearly time to consider new approaches to break this cycle. It is within this larger context that today's forum examines the prospects for significant breakthroughs toward peaceful reunification through the focus on the end goal of a free and unified Korea utilizing the innovative and comprehensive Korean dream framework. Applying that framework, we believe, can be a strategic game changer and a catalyst that breaks the policy logjam. It posits a strategic end in mind to clarify objectives and build win-win consensus among Koreans on the peninsula and in a diaspora, as well as with key international stakeholders. It provides a policy framework for strategies that are comprehensive rather than narrowly focused. And most importantly, it affirms the longest longstanding aspiration of the Korean people for a unified homeland that uploads, uh, upholds freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. Over the past decade, the Global Peace Foundation and partners have been actively building momentum for Korean-led principled unification with international support, utilizing the Korean Dream Framework. The groundbreaking vehicle in this work, building a broad civil society movement to realize the Korean Dream is Action for Korea United. The AKU Alliance with its thousand constituent organizations is building a groundswell of support, demonstrating that with a compelling vision and a robust movement, that unified Korea, a unified Korea is not a distant dream, but an urgent immediate priority. We look forward to stimulating discussions today, which we hope will, you will find informative, inspirational, and motivating. And we invite you to join with us in multi-sector sector action to support the Korean people as they strive to build a free and unified Korea that realizes the Korean dream. Thank you very much. So he has been very active more than anybody else to achieve uh, global peace and free unified Korea. Be one of us for international president, uh, Mr. Jim Flynn. Thank you. Next, we're going to listen to a congressional speech. Uh, Mr. Lee jong Chairman of the Korea Council for Reconciliation and Cooperation, who served as a fighter lawmaker and full leader of the Democratic Party. He is a descendant of the representative independence activists who created today's Republic of Korea, has been working together since 2017. Please give him a big round of applause. Yeah. 
광복 77주년. I'd like to congratulate the opening of International Forum on One Korea, also marking 77th uh, liberation, a year of uh, liberation of Korea from Japan. Also, I'd like to thank Dr. Hyun Jin Moon, Chairman of Global Peace Foundation, and I'd like to thank all the leaders of uh, different organizations participating in the efforts. So we have had uh, International Forum on One Korea for many, many years. And our accumulate our achievements have been accumulated so far. So this forum has been a pioneering and an active platform for the efforts towards unification of Korea for more than decades. Um, so many organizations have taken part, and I'm one of these people uh, who can say confidently uh, about how much we have achieved so far. Thankfully, Korea could achieve so much up until now. We have had the global pandemic, which actually hit the whole world. However, Korea actually could come up with countermeasures and could run up again. So over uh, decades of the blockage of a demarcation line, we actually are the peninsula that has been isolated for many, many years. It is also the land of also the Korean uh, dream, which has not been realized yet. Many say that uh, this crisis has turned into an opportunity. There has been a lot of conflicts between the Koreas, but we are moving beyond it. And also in terms of their uh, regime um, improvement and change, we are making a lot of progress in South Korea actually has become one of the advanced countries in the world almost overnight. So that is why, I mean, we have uh, gathered together today with great happiness. However, what we do wish for in this international forum is unify Korea. And uh, there are several hurdles we have in this journey forward. First of all, um, 20 years efforts um, surrounding the Korean Peninsula have uh, not progressed so much because of the nuclearization of North Korea. So South Korea actually uh, has no nuclear weapon because of many restraints. So in order to actually balance it out, I mean, there should be a lot of expenditures that might be so much necessary to counterattack that. Second, China and the US actually have been in conflict with one another, staying away from reconciliation and peaceful dialogue. So they're neck and neck against each other. So there have been many reasons for that. Security. Um, is the top priority for the U.S. and economy, top priority for China. That have been the norm in the past, but they're not so much valid anymore, I would say. Thirdly, as you're well aware, the russia ukraine war has been prolonging for long. So there have been a lot of uh, hard hit aspects by the war in uh, Far East Asia. So it seems like North Korea and China are forging their relationship even further. So in order to achieve unification on the Korean Peninsula, I think that we will actually be tapping on to untapped opportunities, which would be like blue ocean. It's not just limited to reduction of conflicts. It is to make sure that conflict regions could turn into peaceful regions. International Forum One Korea is uh, cherishing one of the most important values that is the liberation and freedom of individuals, which is the basis for unification of the Korean Peninsula. And that very value um, could be spread out to the world. The Korean Peninsula's unification will be fully thriving in the future, I'll say. Thank you. Thank you for the words he gave us.
uh, cheering remarks and insights on international forum on, on Korea, um, especially in building peace and unification on the Korean Peninsula. Once again, let's give a brief round of applause. Thank you. Now I'd like to move on to special remarks by the leaders of each country. So seven uh, leaders, uh, leaders from seven countries who share their insights with the aspirations of achieving a free and unified Korea. First of all, we will uh, invite Honorary Moon Pyo Hong. Honorary Representative Hong Moon Pyo from People Power Party will deliver his speech. He is a four term lawmaker who served as the chairman of the National Assembly's Education Committee and the Special Committee on Budget and Accounts. Please give him a big, a big hand. <laughs> So, celebrating the 77th anniversary of the liberation of day of Korea and as sharing our aspirations for global peace and unification, the scholars, leaders have all gathered today. I'm really honored to meet you all, and I believe the gathering and this international forum shows the direction that the Republic of Korea needs to go in. in. I would also like to express my gratitude to the overseas participants who have come to discuss how we can achieve unification on the Korean Peninsula. Please give the scholars from overseas a big hand. My special appreciation goes to Dr. Hyunjin Moon, who organized this forum, as well as Mr. Jim Flynn, the international president of the Global Peace Foundation. Also, there is a former member of the National Assembly who is also leading the Korean Parliamentarian Society, Mr. Kim Chung Hwan. I'd like to thank him for his efforts to put this forum together. Here are a few messages that I'd like to share that we have uh, five sessions where we discuss the unification of Korean Peninsula and the global peace with scholars from all over the world. That will produce some directions we need to go into. However, I would like to point out, uh, uh, I would like to deliver two messages. First one is that, to be sure, we need unification. However, what the question is how? I think uh, achieving unification, discussing the human rights issues of North Korea can be quite challenging. So the efforts of the past decades have not led to much result because of that. I think we need to focus more on the economic issues. There would be a lot of circumstances and theories explaining this case. However, we need to reflect on the case of unification of East and West Germany. The second message is that there are five major countries surrounding the Korean Peninsula. And I think we need to find a way to achieve unification in cooperation with those countries as well. And that would only be possible when we think of the cultural issue and other issues as well. So at the National Assembly, where I served with Honorary Jung Lee, we have a forum on Eurasia discussing unification issues. There, uh, so we went to Russia, China, and Europe as part of this forum, and the first thing we saw was the railroad connecting Europe to Europe. Of course, that railway has not been accomplished, but if there is a railroad that connects Europe to China, Russia, to North Korea, that will be beneficial to achieving unification. 
So back then, we discussed these matters. Without the participation of North Korea, we assumed that North Korea would not participate in this roadmap. Uh, that goal might be hard to achieve. However, we believe that we need to put in efforts to achieve that goal. I think that is why the scholars and leaders from home and abroad have gathered today to discuss specifically how we can achieve that goal. I believe the, there is one shortcut to uni, uh, unifying the two Koreas, which is to focus on agricultural industry, agricultural issues when achieving unification. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, for the last three years, North Korea has been reported to have severe food shortages. On 9th of this month, Kim Jong-un gave an address saying that North Korea developed a new weapon and it was a threat to the international society. Actually, that was a key message that Kim Jong-un used to deliver in his past addresses. However, this time it was different because he focused on the food shortages. I believe that was because the COVID-19 pandemic hit the North Korean economy as well. I think to address these financial difficulties of North Korea, unification can be a solution. So we need to focus on the economic issues for unification. In the past, we implemented a sunshine policy and provided support to North Korea. However, North Korea responded with the military provocations. This means that the sunshine policy will not work now. Uh, I think rather we need to focus on the agricultural issue because the food shortages have to be reserved. Now food has become a security issue and has been weaponized. So reflecting this reality, we need to consider uh, mutual cooperation between North and South Korea through the issue of the food. In addition, the railroad connection in Eurasia has already been uh, started with the efforts of the National Assembly of Korea. So I believe the leaders of society and culture in Korea and the world need to step up to find solutions. If that is possible, then unification might not be a far-fetched goal. Once again, I'd like to uh, thank the scholars and leaders who have gathered today at this meaningful forum. I think this forum is a very meaningful occasion for the Republic of Korea. I will also work hand in hand with all of you and do my best for the unification of the Korean Peninsula. My special thanks once again go to the scholars and leaders and experts who have come to Korea. I wish you good health and please join me in building a better Korea. I wish you good luck and health. Thank you. Thank you. Honorary Moon Kyo-hong for your insights and your encouragement for the unification of the Korean Peninsula. Please give him a big hand once again. Thank you. Now I'm going to introduce you, Mr. Lee Sang-min, a five-time lawmaker who is a member of the Foreign Affairs Unification Committee and chairman of the Korea EU Parliamentary Foreign Affairs Forum. Lawmaker Lee it could not uh, join us because of the schedule at the Democratic Party. It sent us a video speech, so please watch the video. Good morning, I am Lee Sang-min, lawmaker of the National Assembly.
Congratulations on the opening of International Forum on One Korea on the 77th anniversary of Korea's liberation from Japan's colonial rule. I deeply appreciate the hard work of Dr. Hyunjin, President Moon, Chairman of the Global Peace Foundation, or other people who have organized this event. I'd like to also say greetings to everybody who is here today. First of all, I'd like to ask for your understanding that I am not with you in person. I truly wanted to go there to deliver a speech. However, there has been overlapping of the schedule for the critical meeting at the party, so please bear with me on that. Now, the world is in a very serious situation on the Korean Peninsula. The hegemony competition between the US and China is intensifying day by day. The international situation, including Russia's invasion of Ukraine, is very unstable. In addition, inflationary crises such as high prices and high interest rates, supply chain disruptions, climate change, energy crisis, and economic stagnation are also aggravating the crisis faced by the mankind in the world. In addition, there was a time when peace seemed to um, come to the Korean Peninsula for a while, but recently the tension on the peninsula has become even worse. Therefore, it is very meaningful that prominent scholars and political and civic groups from home and abroad have gathered at this meaningful forum to prepare wisdom for peaceful unification and joint prosperity on the Korean Peninsula. Up until now, the International Forum on One Korea has been pursuing and aiming for peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula and has carried out various campaigns and activities to realize the dream. I hope that the International Forum on One Korea could achieve its desired dream in the near future. And I, as a member and lawmaker of the National Assembly, will actively support the dream and provide policy support at the parliamentary level. Once again, I'd like to congratulate you on the opening of the International Forum and thank you for your hard work. I'd like to also wish that everybody who participates in this international forum good health and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. So, lawmaker uh, Isang Min has uh, provided us with great support for the achievement of. Uh, Korean Peninsula's uh, unification. Now we would like to invite our participants from overseas for their remarks. First, David Maxwell, a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracy. Mr. Maxwell, a retired colonel, is an expert in special warfare who, warfare, who has worked in Asia for more than 30 years. Please welcome him with a big hand. Thank you. Good morning. I'm I'd like to thank all the organizers, sponsors, contributors, and participants uh, in this great event and for the opportunity to be among such distinguished speakers and leaders. Dr. Moon, I was moved by your remarks yesterday at the celebration uh, for Park One, and congratulations uh, to you for accomplishing the construction of this new landmark for Korea. Everything that you say and do seems to be tied to your vision, a vision we all must share, the Korean dream. It made me think about the one strategic question we should continually ask ourselves and our organizations. How does this action, whatever it is, contribute to achieving a free and unified Korea? Or what I like to describe as a united Republic of Korea. You are okay, you rock. 
You're going to hear me repeat free and unified Korea, and many of us will repeat those words today. And I'll repeat that, and you rock over and over again, so please bear with me. The title of my remarks today is to honor Korean Liberation, Korean Liberation Day pledge to realize a free and unified Korea. I'm going to make four main points using the three-step methodology of the U.S. Special Operations Community. Number one is to appreciate the context. Number two is to understand the problem. And number three is to develop an approach. So first, to appreciate the context, North Korea is the, th the threat to national security and national prosperity, not only for South Korea, but also the region and the world. Second, to understand the problem. The division of the peninsula is the strategic problem. Third is to develop an approach. Civil society must support a free and unified Korea. And lastly, freedom and unification are the necessary conditions for peace. So to appreciate the context, as we observe Liberation Day in Korea on August 15th, I think it is important to put things in perspective and keep in mind that Korea is not yet truly liberated. We, have, we do not yet have a free and unified Korea. And we do not need to ask why that is, but I will state the obvious. It is because the Kim family regime, a mafia-like crime family cult, rules the northern half of this great peninsula and enslaves 25 million Koreans in the north. At the same time, it poses an existential threat to the Republic of Korea and the nearly 52 million Koreans living in the south. The most dangerous of all is that the regime seeks to bring the entire peninsula under the rule of what I like to call the guerrilla dynasty and gulag state, officially known by the most ironic name, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, a country that is neither democratic nor a republic and certainly does not belong to the people. Of course, we face myriad threats from the North, the worst case being war with its full range of weapons of mass destruction to inst internal instability and regime collapse in the North and all that entails from refugees to an immense humanitarian disaster and civil war and chaos. The North is also actively working to subvert the South and its relations with the United States and the international community. And it is conducting illicit activities around the world from the proliferation of weapons to conflict zones to counterfeiting and money laundering, the cyber attacks to drug trafficking. But worst of all, it is conducting crimes against humanity on a scale we have not seen since World War II. It is the worst human rights violator in the modern era. The Korean people in the North are suffering because of Kim Jong-un's deliberate decision to prioritize nuclear weapons and missiles and support to the elite and the military over the welfare of the people. And due to the geostrategic location of this peninsula, what happens in Korea will have global effects in all domains, from economic to diplomatic to security. We all have reason to want to contribute to peace and stability on the Korean peninsula and the welfare of some 80 million Koreans on both sides of the demilitarized zone. So to understand the problem, the challenge is how to reach peace and ensure the welfare of all Koreans. The bottom line is the only way we are gonna see an end to the nuclear program and the military threats, as well as the human rights abuse, abuses, is through achievement of unification and the establishment of a free and unified Korea. Some things are easy to see, some things are easy to say, yet they are very difficult to achieve. But we cannot be dissuaded from this goal by the uncertainty of the future and the complexity that is caused by the existence of the Kim family regime. While the ROC has developed, has become a developed and advanced nation, the DPRK is stuck in time because of the nature of the regime and its objectives and strategy to dominate the peninsula on its terms. It refuses outside help. It refuses to reform its economy and it refuses to allow freedom in the North. It seeks regime survival through domination. The complexity of unification has led to strategic planning paralysis. The North Korean situation has been described as a wicked problem, an issue or concern that is difficult to explain and inherently impossible to resolve. The Korean people in the North are trapped in a vicious cycle of deprivation, corruption, repression, and endemic bribery, according to the UN Commission of Inquiry. But it must be solved. And as my brothers in the South Korean Special Forces say, make the impossible possible. Andemun dwege hara. So to develop an approach, 
The UN and Biden administration, as well as civil society in both the Republic of Korea and the US and countries around the world have an opportunity for a new approach to the Korea security challenge. The ROC US Alliance way ahead is an integrated deterrence strategy as part of the broader strategic competition that is taking place in the region. There is a need for a Korean plan B strategy that rests on the foundational, uh, the foundation of the combined ROC US defensive capabilities. It includes political warfare, aggressive diplomacy, sanctions, cyber operations, and information and influence activities with a goal of denuclearization. But ultimately, the objective must be to solve the Korea question. And this is outlined in paragraph 60 of the 1953 armistice, the unnatural division of the Korean Peninsula. With an understanding that denuclearization of the North and an end to the human rights abuses and crimes against humanity will only happen when this Korea question is resolved. And such resolution will lead to a free and unified Korea, otherwise known as a United Republic of Korea. Civil society can make great contributions to help achieve this worthy goal. I believe there are four paths to unification. The first is war, which we must work to deter, but we also must be absolutely prepared for. The second is regime collapse, which can lead to war and widespread conflict and human suffering. The desired path is peaceful unification and the merging of North and South through mutual agreement. And the fourth is the emergence of new leadership in the North who will seek peaceful unification. South Korea, with the support of its friends, partners, and allies, and civil society around the world, should plan and prepare for peaceful unification. Paradoxically, this is the most complex and difficult path to unification, and possibly the least likely to occur because Kim Jong-un is unlikely to ever go quietly into the night. But it is the morally right path because we must seek to do it peacefully, as peacefully as possible. However, even if war or regime collapse occurs, all the work done for peaceful planning will still have application in the unification process. Regardless of one of the four, any of the four paths taken, peaceful planning, planning for peaceful unification will provide the foundation for a free and unified Korea. While the ROC and US governments as alliance partners should form their own unification task force, civil society can play a very important supporting role and contribute to a free and unified Korea. I recommend the formation of civil society task forces that are willing to support the goal of a free and unified Korea. There is much work that can be done in the long-term preparation for future humanitarian assistance, education, economic engagement, infrastructure development, political process integration, and communications, just to name a few areas for considerations. And frankly speaking, there are many Koreans who are fearful of the enormous costs of unification, but these fears can be overcome if civil society members around the world are willing to step up and show their support for the Korean people. One of the areas where civil society can begin immediate work is in information. The UN Commission of Inquiry identified this as one of the most egregious human rights abuses, writing, quote, Throughout the history of the DPRK, among the most striking features of the state has been its claim to an absolute monopoly over information and total control of organized social life. The commission finds that there is an almost complete denial of the right of, to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, as well as the rights to freedom of opinion, expression, information, and association." End quote. Kim Jong-un denies access to information because he fears it will undermine the legitimacy of his rule and it would erode the regime's ability to maintain absolute control over the population. While the North is isolated by design, information is getting into the North through myriad electronic media and pathways to help inform and educate the Korean people in the North and prepare them for eventual unification. Furthermore, there are Koreans from the North working around the world Although difficult due to North Korean security services, efforts should be made by civil society task forces in countries where North Korean workers uh, are living to, to engage them and to also inform them and help them bring back knowledge and ideas. Lastly, civil society and governments also need to understand the Korea question and the importance of unification for the Korean people, the region, and the world. The removal of a rogue nuclear country and a major human rights abuser is in the interests of the international community. In addition, the contribution that a free and unified Korea with some 80 million Koreans 
uh, combining the industry and advanced technology of the South with the vast untapped resources of the North will make substantial contributions to the global economy. And the possibilities for civil society support to a free and unified Korea are limited only by our imaginations. Now, lastly, I will say that freedom and unification are the necessary conditions for peace. As we observe Liberation Day on Monday in Korea, we should be thankful for, for the rights that we all enjoy, such as the four freedoms that President Roosevelt's famous speech and that are now enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. We should ask when the Korean people will realize this statement in the Universal Declaration, quote, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood, end quote. And we should all aspire to help all Koreans to achieve the freedom they called for in their own declaration of independence in 1919. And I quote, we claim independence in the interest of the eternal and free development of our people and in accordance with the great movement for world reform based upon the awakening conscience of mankind. We need to awaken our conscience. South Korea experienced the miracle on the Han, while the only miracle in the North is that the Korean people continue to survive under the most despotic regime in the 21st century. The ROK is the only developed nation in history to go from a major aid recipient to a major donor nation and become the 10th largest economy in the world with a global reputation for excellence. The Korean people in the South accomplished this due to their hard work, ingenuity, initiative, and sacrifice, and with the support of friends, partners, and allies. The unification process will be difficult, but with the support of nations and civil society, it can and must lead to a second miracle in the 21st century, a free and unified Korea. Now let me close and say again, the only way we are gonna see an end to the nuclear programs the nuclear program, military threats, as well as the human rights abuses is through achievement of unification and the establishment of a free and unified Korea. One that is secure and stable, non-nuclear, economically vibrant with free market principles and unified under a liberal constitutional form of government based on individual liberty, freedom, the rule of law and human rights as determined by the Korean people. A free and unified Korea or in short, a United Republic of Korea. Let me end with the Korean Special Forces greeting when saluting that they always, they always say to each other, Tong Il, unification. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell, for emphasizing your support for the Korean dream and how we can overcome the challenge through the solidarity of the U.S. and Korea as well as the civil society solidarity. Thank you again. Please give him a big hand. Now I'm going to introduce to you Mr. Nobuo Tanaka, the former Executive Director of International Energy Agency. Let's watch the video I am speech. delighted to be invited to make a statement for the International Forum on One Korea Today. Dr. Fatih Birol, the executive director of the International Energy Agency, said recently, we are in the middle of the first global energy crisis. In the 70s, it was the oil crisis. And now we have an oil crisis, a natural gas crisis, a coal crisis and an electricity crisis. All prices are skyrocketing and energy security is a priority for many governments, if not all. There comes another and a bigger crisis. The IEA was established in 1974 at the first oil shock, but last year, its publication called Net Zero by 2050 triggered the first IEA shock. Dr. Birol said that energy companies must stop all new oil and gas exploration projects from this year if net zero 2050 should happen, and he panicked OPEC plus and oil producing companies. More than 150 countries announced carbon neutral 
around the middle of the century. Many megatech firms like GAFAM and auto companies declare carbon neutral with their whole supply chain by 2030s. The climate crisis is really coming. President Putin of Russia may have decided to invade into Ukraine before the peak demand of oil or gas happens as net zero 2050 report indicates. A resulting war with, uh, uh, of Europe uh, and Russia uh, pushed many European nations away from Russian gas to more renewable and nuclear power. The IEA just published the nuclear report and said that nuclear energy could play an important role in ensuring rapid and secure energy transition. If Nord Stream gas pipeline be shut down by the end of the year, Germany may be forced to postpone the phase out of nuclear power. But a new era for nuclear power is by no means guaranteed. The European taxonomy for sustainable investment calls for tighter conditions for nuclear power. Safer fuels and less risky SMRs are needed together with concrete plans for disposal of radioactive nuclear waste. I think there is an important condition for nuclear power to be sustainable. It is proliferation resistant nuclear technology. Russian invasion to Ukraine may have urged non-weapon states to have a weapon. If Ukraine didn't return some of its weapons to Russia, Russia may not have invaded Ukraine. Sustainable nuclear system must be first SMR with passive safe features. Secondly, it must have concrete plan for the radioactive waste disposal. And thirdly, it must be proliferation resistant technology. There exists such a technology, integral fast reactor and pyroprocessing of the Idaho National Laboratory of the United States. This technology can be used to take care of meltdown fuel debris of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Korea, Japan, and the US should work together to promote this technology as a sustainable nuclear power by inviting like-minded countries to, jo to a joint development project such as versatile test reactor. As a first step, Japan and Korea can work together with the US to denuclearize North Korea by moving its plutonium to Japan and highly enriched uranium to Korea to burn in our nuclear reactors. This is the ultimate peace use of our nuclear reactors. To enhance confidence of our neighbors, Japan and Korea should join the nuclear weapon ban treaty as well. I hope Korea and Japan engage into my ideas to enable peaceful unification of Korea Peninsula. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, former Executive Director uh, Nobuo Tanaka. He gave very good uh, importance, emphasized the importance of South Korea US Japan cooperation to resolve the North Korean nuclear issue. Although he is not here with us in person, let us give him a big round of applause for giving us excellent remarks. Thank you. Now we have four more speeches from <coughs> leaders from overseas for the efficient operation of the forum. But please stick to your time limit of five minutes. Thank you for your cooperation. So our next speaker is Dr. Musta Mulia, founder of the Mulia Raya Foundation in Indonesia. Dr. Mulia is the first female research professor at the Indonesian Academy of Sciences. Please give her a big hand.
distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Actually, Indonesia purely supports a free and unified Korea as a as a catalyst for regional and global peace and development. I believe that all Indonesian people will always try for what be peace based on respect for humanity, independence, and social justice, according to my ideology, Pancasila. Our ideology, Pancasila, consists of five principles. The principle of spirituality, the principle of humanity, the principle of the unity of Indonesia, the principle of democracy, and the, the principle of social justice. These five principles are very, very compatible with the universal values of human rights and also the concept of peace building. In upholding peace and reunification of Korean Peninsula, in my opinion, there are at least four important things must be done. First, the importance of peace efforts. I personally really appreciate the efforts of the government and people of the Republic of Korea to build lasting peace, starting with the decision to join the United Nations in 1991, then with expanding its active participation in multilateral diplomatic relations coincided with its growing global position economically. The world also really appreciates the important role of Ban Ki-moon, who previously the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of South Korea to become Secretary General of the United Nations. We all know that during nearly two decades at the United Nations, the Republic of Korea has actively participated in many peace efforts and the resolution of international problems handled by the UN, such as conflict prevention and peacekeeping missions, development projects, and protection of human rights, and so on and so forth. I do believe that these efforts to uphold peace must continue to improve and strengthen so that they become the foundation of a free and unified of Korea. Secondly, the importance of dialogue and cultural efforts. I have always believed that the Korean nation has a very, very strong cultural identity. Korean nation have the same identity and cultural character because both are rooted in the same family. In my opinion, there will be this, the big spirit and at the same time, the key to peace for the reunification of Korea. I'm thinking about other possibilities of reunification of Korean Peninsula. If the step of reunification is too difficult to achieve, I think it's better to start first with many efforts to build peace on the civil society level. I think this might be more acceptable to everyone. So it's kind of a gradual effort, not all at once. The best option now is how to stop the threat of war and start partnerships in many deals such as economics and culture to bring about peace between South and North Korea. Peace efforts of this kind have actually started in Indonesia, in my country, for example. In 2018, we have Asian Games event, which was held in uh, Jakarta, made quite a touching history since the Korean conflict, which has lasted for more than 70 years. At the moment, the continents of South and North Korea united to carry the big name of Korea by using the unification flag. That is very, very cool and very beautiful. The third important thing is the importance of women's participation. The Security Council adopted Resolution 1325, an important revolution on women, peace, and security. It is a policy framework that aims to promote gender equality and improve women's rights, participation, and protection in conflict situation. This global conflict 
this global policy encourages a gender-based approach to recognize the role of women in all areas, including in peace efforts related to reunification of Korean Peninsula. This resolution further emphasizes the important role of women in conflict prevention, in peacekeeping, peace negotiation, peace building, in post-conflict reconstruction. So this resolution also demands equal part participation in promoting and maintaining peace and security. Therefore, cultural dialogue should be carried out more and more and also involve all elements of society, including women. Women with their maternal instincts find it easier to embrace and uni unite those torn apart by war and conflict. Women must be involved in all stages, in all processes of peace reconciliation towards the reunification of Korea. I have witnessed the extraordinary work of women's groups in many areas of conflict and war. They usually work from a sincere heart and without any political interest. The only goal is to see their nation united in peace and work together towards the realization of a more advanced civilization. I believe that it's also the desire of the entire Korean nation. The real Korean people are one family, one nation, one soul, and one character in culture. The last but not least is the importance of respect, the principle of sovereignty. In addition to the cultural element, another thing that is no less important is the principle of sovereignty in the political field. In dialogue, it is important to respect the sovereignty of all parties. The principle of sovereignty in politics is very, very important for peace. The description of sovereignty in the political field means that eternal, that eternal peace can only be carried out by the Korean nation itself without any intervention from other countries. That is very important. The realization of peace and the unification of Korea is very, very important for all nations, even for all human beings, including Indonesian people. Because with peace and unity, many forms of cooperation that benefit the international community can be carried out. But the most important thing is that peace is an absolute condition for survival, security, and prosperity for all human beings. Finally, we know that peace cannot be built in a short period of time, more so through hard-hearted efforts. Building peace must be through hard efforts. They are organized, systemic, and involves all elements of society. And most importantly, it comes from a strong commitment from within ourselves, from within the family, and further on from a larger community. It is definitely not easy, but we must work hard if we want to have peace. So, Dr. Moon, so there is still much work to be done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Musta, for your support for the Korean dream and emphasizing the importance of continuous mutual trust between the two Koreans and the importance of the tolerance. Please give her a big hand. Thank you. Now I'm going to invite Dr. Chris Chirwonsak, who is the founder of the Nation Building Institute in Thailand. Dr. Tir Wonsak served as a parliamentarian advisor to the Thai Prime Minister. Let's give him a big round of applause. Chairman Dr. Moon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my deep pleasure to be here, invited by this great organization in something that I do believe in, world peace. The universe is one. If the universe is one, therefore it is interconnected and it's also interdependent. And because of the essential nature of the universe is one, surely 
every components in the universe, including Korea, should be one. Let me state at the outset that the university of the world is not a multiversity. The original word is universitas, which means we are essentially everything is one. Knowledge is a body of knowledge is one. And therefore, humanity is one. Therefore, with pleasure, this conference invited me to address an issue of free and unified Korea is therefore is something I deeply believe in. Let me say this, that I'm old enough to be friends with some of the old general of Thailand who fight in the Korean War. I'm young enough to believe that if we were involved as Thai people in helping in the Korean War, I shall represent Thailand to help in the Korea peace and bringing the unity and unification of what you have desired stated so succinctly in the name of this conference. Free and unified Korea, a catalyst for regional and global peace and development. Let me say this, that why is so difficult for a one Korea to happen over this lifetime, which I have lived 67 years? Basically, I think it's a mindset problem. The mindset is the greatest hindrance of our life. And when you have unbelief, this is what happened in evidentiality. Politically, economically, socially, the mindset of unbelief has deterred what can happen and make it impossible. Why? I do understand that decades of failures in terms of discussion, 630 inter-Korean dialogues, four summits on the talk of unification, and 10 prime minister level talk is long time enough to make the mindset feeling like it's an impossible concept. And when you look deep into the difficulties politically, let me just say clearly, it's an uphill task. Why? There's ide ideological differences of the North Korean mindset and the South Korean mindset. It's a huge gulf of difference. One is a free democratic South Korea. On the other side, it's not so free and more authoritarian North Korea. One is from the free market regime and the other is from central planning, more dictatorial regime. Therefore, I can see why politically the mindset can be very difficult. How could you unify ideological differences? How can you unify democracy with dictatorship? Economically, Koreans have become very powerfully and prosperous. We used to be at the same level between Thailand and Korea when I was doing my PhD. At that time, today, Koreans surpass Thailand, and I'm glad with you. You have become part of the OECD first world for a long time, South Korea. But the North Korean brothers are very poor. Economically, it's difficult to bridge. It's an uphill task. And as Dr. Moon has said so well in our openings time with the speakers just now before we enter into this audience is the cia has said it's two trillion dollars cost in unifying korea and dollars talks money matter and it deter it make people feel like can korea handle it because the cost is going to fall largely on the south korean and therefore how could you unify when it's an economic uphill task the economy of Korea 
The north and the south are vastly different. The size is so different. The prosperity, the level of development is so different. And the strength of the economy are so different. The Korean are the maybe the fourth largest world exporter, one of the largest foreign direct investor in the entire world, including our own region in Thailand. You are part of the OECD first world status. Therefore, it's such a huge economic uphill task for anybody, anybody to dare to dream to unify Korea. But I congratulate Dr. Moon for a vivid and powerful deep from his heart the desire to unify Korea, which I honor from what I hear yesterday and today. Socially is an uphill task. Why? Let me tell you clearly. The trust factor is missing. I have followed all the dialogues and all the situation over the past many years of my life. I served my country after my PhD at the age of 25 until now 67, 42 years of national service. I served many prime ministers. I was in parliament as member of parliament myself. I sit in the halls of power on the corridor of power of my nation. Let me tell you, it's very difficult to even believe that it can be possible to unify Korea together. Korea has powerful influence in the world. The trust factor is missing between the North and the South. I went to the military, the borderline of the military zone of the two countries. It looks tough. Human development level is so different. You have the celebrated, great, powerful university of Seoul National University, Yongsai University, equivalent to my Harvard and Oxford, Cambridge background. But the Korean in the North has no education, hardly. How many people can truly be skilled and knowledgeable enough to enter into the big integrated economy and socially? It's an uphill task. The value is the most essential thing, very difficult to bridge. How can the two value systems side by side sitting together this, let alone integrated to be one? I'm telling you all the difficulties not to tell you not to do it. Just to tell you, to congratulate you that you're doing something beyond the normal capability of human imagination. But let me tell you, if Korea unified, the region will benefit. Let me tell, tell you why ASEAN, for example, is a representative region which I belong to, will benefit. We will benefit in our mind, my set that we will believe in one ASEAN. I'm a champion of ASEAN unification at a higher level. I dare to dream of United States of ASEAN. This is out of the political policy of my own party that I used to belong, which is the oldest political party and the, one of the most important political party in my country. I know the forefathers who established ASEAN. My deputy prime minister, the late deputy prime minister, Tanat Koman, who found ASEAN together with the rest of a few core ASEAN members. But today, frankly speaking, ASEAN is like a paper tiger. They have no tools. It will not go much further unless we go a more unified way. Therefore, if you unify Korea, ASEAN may think there's a possibility. Therefore, it will help us with our mindset that we can unify the impossible ASEAN. Socially, we are so different. Multi-religious background, multi-racial, multi-linguistic kind of background. Our economy is so different between the powerful economy, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, and the less developed economy in the rest of 
many ASEAN countries. So it's a huge difference. Socially, politically, we have formed the Free Democratic Thailand, where some our ASEAN members are from the former communist regime. And therefore, if you can unify in Korea, we may think of the mindset of possibility of unifying ASEAN too. So for regional prosperity and problem can be resolved. Let me say it also quickly, the global benefit, not only the regional benefit, because your theme is regional peace and development and global peace and development. Today, the world is slowly decoupling between the Chinese-led bloc, may I say that, and the US-led bloc. It's slowly decoupling and is departing at this juncture of history, which is very dangerous, that could enter into any kind of conflicts, the peace that we will not want to allow it to go away. Politically, it's the difficult world we are living in. Simplifying by some representative proxy war in the Ukraine conflict. We also see the economic difficulties in this world. While the entire world is prospering more and more, but the unequal world and the poverty of the world and the disparity of the world is so clearly stark in our eyes. Socially, the world has never been so divided. Let me tell you, it's so sad to see humanity so divided. Therefore, if Korean can be one, we have the hope that ASEAN for in the region and other regions can be one, and the world, the global world can benefit to be one. Let me conclude by saying something from deep from my heart. Thailand was a small friend of Korea. I have a deep fondness of Korea all my lifetime, been here so many times, many good friends here. In fact, some of your key leaders in, in last previous governments and present government are friends. As a small friend of Korea, I want to offer you some hope. I want to tell you that, pardon my academic background, as professor of economics and management, Kenneth Arrow, the Nobel Prize laureate in economics, have created a theorem called theory of impossibility, mathematical fanciness. But I want to say today, the theory of possibility, which is not mathematically fancy, easy to digest and understand by all. I have said there are three key equations, three rules, for the possibility theory in my mind, for you to apply to one career, number one. Rule number one, that you want to make things possible, I would say this, believe that you can do. If you believe you can do, then you can do. <laughs> believe you can do what you think you cannot do. Believe you can do when other things they cannot do, can do spirit. Thank you, David, your vice president, who have looked into my Facebook and said that they call me Dan can do in my country. And when I campaigned for the governor of Bangkok, they said Dan can do. Yes, can do spirit in your mind. Rule number one, if you want to unify Korea, you have to fight a mindset problem, a can do spirit. Yes, believe you can do. Rule number two, of the possibility theorem that I want to suggest here, not only belief, but action, do too, do it now. You got to take action, not only believe, but take action. And rule number three, let me give it to you for my possibility theory. Give up, never, never do, never give up. If you do these three things, one day I will celebrate with you when I come back again one more time in Korea. Yes, it's a unified Korea. I have written a book, out of 200 books I have written in my, my lifetime, Unified Pluralism. I believe that true unification and unity is to unify the diverse, the diversity of pluralism. And therefore, it is possible to unify Korea. 
it is possible if in your mind you can do it. Let me conclude by saying the world is one big family. I believe that from all my heart. For the last 42 years, I have written something that the world is one large family. If you believe that we are one big large family, and others of our brothers have done so, look across the shoulders over the last many years, Germany. I have the privilege of being in Germany for many years in a row for 20 years discussing with many dignitaries like Henry Kissinger of the US and other great leaders. We saw unification of Germany, the East and the West. Yes, it was costly, but the German can do it. And if they can do it, the Korean can do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. He actually uh, awakened us on the importance of the uh, unification of the Korean Peninsula and be optimistic about that dream and the, the synergies the unification will bring about to the world and within Asia. Let's welcome, uh, let us uh, give him a big round of applause, please. The next speaker is Ambassador Ashok Sajanhar, a clear career diplomat who served as an Indian ambassador to Sweden and Kazakhstan. He is currently a member of the Noah Panika Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. Please give him a big round of applause. Honorable Dr. Moon and Dr. Moon, eminent founders and chairpersons of the Global Peace Foundation, distinguished speakers, honorable participants. I'd like to sincerely thank the organizers of this important conference for inviting me to share my thoughts with this knowledgeable audience. I'm indeed honored to address you on the subject of unification of Korea which is immensely vital and critical to peace, not only in this region, but indeed the whole world. Friends, history over centuries and millennia has taught us that man <clears throat> mankind and nations prosper and develop, and humans are able to realize their full potential and aspirations when they live in an environment of peace. Wars and conflicts have only resulted in destruction of human lives and vital infrastructure. This has been visible to us most starkly in the two world wars that the world witnessed over the last century. It is a matter of some satisfaction that the world has not been subjected to another similar carnage and conflagration over the last 77 years. The last seven decades have, however, witness scores of smaller and not so small conflicts in different parts of the world. Impact of such conflicts can be much worse since the world today has access to nuclear weapons as well as other weapons of mass destruction. The destructive capacity of conventional weapons is also much greater today than it has ever been in the past. Moreover, Rogue actors, including terrorists, have emerged on the world scene, which make the task of ensuring peace even more crucial than it has ever been in the past. Several terrorist groups are supported by different governments for their own personal interests, which makes the task of confronting them even more challenging. It is highly regrettable that while a totally unnecessary war drags on in Europe, with devastating implications and ramifications for the world, security, economic stability, and prosperity, we witness further ratcheting up of tensions in the Taiwan Straits, South China Sea, East China Sea, Yellow Sea, and the Bohai Sea. It is imperative that the world come together to apply every form of pressure to promote harmony in the region and beyond. Friends, unification of the two Koreas and restoration of peace amongst them presents one of the most intractable challenges confronting the global community today. 
a new framework would need to be evolved, which would entail bringing the citizens and the economies of the two rival Koreas together while maintaining the separate countries and political systems. Several models for reunification have been suggested. I feel that one suitable approach would be to use the model of launch and evolution of the European Union. As the then Foreign Minister of France, Robert Schuman, articulated in the declaration named after him, we must make the war not only unthinkable, but also materially impossible. The European Union started with small steps, but has evolved both horizontally and vertically to emerge as the most successful and as a role model for other regional integration bodies and institutions. Similarly, the unification of East and West Germany in the early 1990s is a bright example to seek inspiration from to unite the North and South Koreas. Although these models are significantly different from the situation in the Koreas, I feel that there are several elements that are common and the European experience can be put to good use to expedite the process of the Korean reunification. Friends, four years have already elapsed since the first ever summit between the South and the North Korean presidents to, uh, was held. While both Seoul and Pyongyang have placed unification on the agenda, neither side has produced a concrete plan to get the process going. Given the gargantuan disparities in domestic political systems and economic development between the two countries. It will be essential to combine the two economies justly and fairly in a step-by-step -step gradual manner, making sure that the South Korea's far larger, larger economy does not overwhelm that of North Korea. Systematic, gradual cooperation would be the only way to go forward to keep stable and expand the economies of the two countries. Seven decades of separation have created major differences between Seoul and Pyongyang, which many of the earlier leaders have also alluded to. The downturn in inter-Korean ties over the past years has adversely affected South Koreans' views towards unification. But a majority of more than 60%, I understand citizens of the country, still see this outcome as necessary. A reunified Korea will be a huge factor of peace, stability, and security in the region and the world. It is essential to provide a fillip to peace in the Indo-Pacific region, as already several flashpoints, like the security of Taiwan, of East China Sea, South China Sea have emerged in the region. In the area of economic development also, the reunification will, pro will provide a huge impetus to economic growth and prosperity in the region, as well as globally. This is particularly imperative today as the global economy has received a body blow in recent times due to the COVID-19 pandemic, due to the Russia-Ukraine conflict and the China-Taiwan tensions. A secure and unified Korean Peninsula was, would ease tensions that have been prevalent throughout history, but have got even more exacerbated recently between the big powers, including the United States, China, Russia, and Japan. If Korea is unified and becomes more stable, it will no longer be an object of contention that other countries can take advantage of. North and South Korea are still at war and peace has only been maintained because of a ceasefire armistice signed in 1953. In addition to this war mindset, recent provocations from the North continue to prompt South Korea 
to spend increasing sums of money on military expenditure for its defense. Reunification and peace process across the 38th parallel will obviate the necessity to increase the military expenditure of the two Koreas and other countries in the region. Friends, India is the land of Hinduism, Lord Buddha and Gandhi. All of them stand for and strongly espouse peace and harmony amongst the peoples of the world. The philosophy of Hinduism is Vasudev Kutumbakam, which means that the whole world is one big family. There should be no enmity, no hatred, no discrimination or inequality between the different religions, languages, ethnicities and nationalities in the world. India enjoys excellent relations with the Republic of Korea, both in the political and strategic, as well as economic and commercial spheres. India also maintains a diplomatic presence in Pyongyang. India stands ready to play its due role in bringing the two countries together. Friends, in conclusion, the global community needs to come together to support the project of reuniting the Koreas. I'm confident that the deliberations at this conference today and day after tomorrow will throw up many useful and practical ideas to achieve our common goal. I look forward to continue to stay engaged with the GPF in realizing this commendable objective. I once again thank the organizers and you, Dr. Moon, for getting us all together and for inviting me and wish the deliberations of the conference all success. Thank you very much. So about Dr. Moon's vision for global peace, the ambassador expressed his gratitude while also emphasizing the importance of unification in driving the growth of the world economy, please give the ambassador a big hand once again. Now I'm going to invite Chairman of the Blue Banner, Mr. Azal Saikan Enksaikan, who served as Ambassador of Mongolia to the UN. Dr. Enkasaikin has taken the lead in realizing a free unified Korea for co-hosting One Korea Forum several times in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Please welcome the speaker with a big round of applause. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I fully agree that this meeting is being held at the critical and fast changing times in the world, including in our Northeast Asian region and the Korean Peninsula. This timely meeting is being held not only to exchange information on the developing challenges, but also consider opportunities separately and jointly to strengthen peace and security that the evolving situation provides to the civil society. It is from that point of view that we Mongolians will be participating in this forum. We fully support peaceful reunification of the Korean nation, seeing it as an important factor for regional and global peace and stability, and contributing thus to common security for all. The post-World War II History has clearly demonstrated that despite its division, the Korean people has an enormous developmental potential that can be used for promoting not only regional cooperation, but contributing enormously to global development and prosperity. This enormous potential will surely double with the peaceful reunification. That is why Mongolians, like other people, support speedy reunification of the Korean people. By doing so, the suffering of the divided people, as well as uh, one of the hotbeds of tension, would be eliminated. 
It is time to look forward and see how such peaceful reunification could be achieved based on the will of the entire Korean people. I'm proud to say that Mongolia maintains good relations with all the states of the region and enjoys relations of traditional friendship with North Korea and relations of comprehensive partnership with South Korea and works to promote regional trust and, and bridge building and play to the extent possible, of course, a mediating role in the region. The 1.5 track Ulaanbaatar dialogue as we all know, is an informal region, no forum, to jointly discuss regions, soft security issues, and promote cooperation, which is needed. In this nuclear area, Mongolia's nuclear weapon free status is widely recognized and benefits from the joint political security guarantees provided by the five nuclear weapon states to it. Its experts, that is, Mongolia's experts, as IAEA inspectors, have experience of working both in North Korea and Iran. Moreover, the country maintains and runs four fully certified CTBTO primary seismic, infrasound, radionuclide, and noble gas stations as its direct contribution to the common call. It is prepared to share not only its experience in these areas, but also in transitioning to an open society and free market economy, share both the achievements gained as well as the mistakes made. As to Blue Banner, it strongly believes that the Korean issue needs to be addressed politically and not through force or pressure that would only lead to further mutual suspicion and tension. Accentuating the positive and working constructively is important since optimism generates ideas and energy to go and look beyond narrow national interests, beyond approaching issues from zero-sum game solutions or the worst case scenario. Today, civil society organizations are playing a very useful role. As Mr. Kofi Annan, Secretary General of the United Nations, had pointed out, in this highly interconnected world, the civil society organizations are becoming a superpower in contributing to the common cause, the examples of which are ICANN and ICBL. ICBL meaning International Campaign to ban landmines. Likewise, the role of Global Peace Foundation and its partner organizations are increasing in bringing the peoples of different countries and continents together to promote the goal of free and unified Korea. In that sense, Blue Banner and some other Mongolian organizations are working to advance the goal by hosting together with GPF one Korea Foundation and AKU, Mongolian Forum, that will, the next meeting of which will be held next month. Dr. Moon had pointed out this morning that Korean dream is a bottom-up process. So is Blue Banner's goal. Blue Banner is also working with its regional peer organizations to promote Northeast Asian nuclear weapon free zone by focusing on its inclusivity and further horizontal proliferation, not nuclear weapons, but proliferation of nuclear weapon free zones by promoting even establishing of single state zones as well. In, in conclusion, I would like to say that Blue Band is looking forward to working with the participants of this forum to jointly promote our common goals. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your great efforts and hard work. 
Honor Ambassador Engelsaiken, please giving me a brilliant applause for encouragement and gratitude. Now we are having the highlight session of this forum you have been waiting for, which is the keynote speech session. But before we have the session, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Hyunjoo President Moon, the founder and chairman of the Gold Peace Foundation, who has been striving for unification and peace on the Korean Peninsula and the realization of world peace for the past 30 years. So, uh, Chairman Moon I graduated from Columbia University Department of History, Harvard Business School. In 2009, he founded Global Peace Foundation and he tried very hard to spread out the global vision in order to put an end to ethnic conflict in different parts of the world. In 2013, he received the UN Special Award. And in, in July 2012, he actually uh, formed the AKU, which is actually a organization uh, based on Hongi Ingan spirit, leading the citizen led grassroots unification movement and global campaign to prepare for peaceful unification on the Korean Peninsula. Dr. Moon's book, Korea and Dream, published in 2014, has been selected as the bestseller of the year and has become a must-read book on the U.S. And also in 2018, it also has become a must-read book of the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, creating great empathy and uh, resonation around the world. But also, Action for Korea United, which celebrated the 10th anniversary in July, is the biggest in scale organization in taking the lead in historic momentum for the construction of a free unified Korea that contributes to global peace by organizing 10 million citizens' campaign for unification by 2025, the 80th anniversary of Korea's liberation. So AKU has been growing so far and uh, Dr. Moon has been supporting fully throughout the journey so far, giving lots of encouragement and support. And let us uh, give Dr. Hyun Jin Press Moon a big round of applause for expression of gratitude. I'd like to invite Dr. Hyun Jin Press Moon, who has presented the Korean dream, a vision of a unified Korean peninsula, and has consistently supported and led those who practice unification, a citizen led grassroots unification movement for the past. 10 years. Please give a big round of applause to Dr. Hyun Jin Press Moon with great uh, respect and gratitude. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let us honor the uh, distinguished speakers. I know it took a long time, but let's give them another round of applause. It is my distinct pleasure and honor in welcoming all of you to the newly built Park One facility located here in Yoido. The political and financial center of Seoul for this very significant forum, examining the vision for a free and unified Korea. Let us give special thanks to the distinguished leaders and policy experts who are contributing to these very important deliberations in person and through the virtual forum. Let's give them all a round of applause. In a few days, we will again commemorate the end of World War II in the Pacific, and with it, Korea's liberation from Japanese colonial rule. It was a moment of great hope for the Korean people who believed that they would finally be able to realize their historic aspiration of creating a model nation that was independent, united, and free. Tragically, however, that did not happen. The dreams of our ancestors rooted in the founding providential mandate of Hong Yi Gan to live for the greater benefit of all mankind 
that inspired the independence movement's goal of creating a new Western-style model nation that was independent and free were not to be realized at that time. Instead, Korea became artificially divided along the ideolo ideological lines of the Cold War and has remained so far for the last 77 years in that unnatural state. As a result, that unfulfilled dream of our ancestors casts a shadow over our celebrations. The collective destiny of both Koreas remains still to be achieved. It is even more urgent today, given the current volatile and threatening geopolitical circumstances in Europe, and especially in this region. Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine and China's assertion of its right to take control of Taiwan by force if necessary, remind us that the Cold War is not completely behind us. These confrontations stem at root from conflicting worldviews. It is important to note that although Russia and China have adopted elements of the free market economy, both nations uplift the power of the state above all else with little regards to the rights of their own citizens and even the rights of their neighbors. Unlike all Western democracies that were shaped by or that had adopted the Judeo-Christian ethos that emphasized the sanctity of human life, created in the image of God, Russia still maintains the political philosophy and aspirations of the Soviet past, couched in a new Russian nationalism, while China never abandoned the Maoist revolution or changed its one-party communist rule. They disregard the universally accepted truth of all Western democracies, immortalized in the United States Declaration of Independence, that all human beings are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, among which is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Most importantly, they fail to recognize that the main purpose of government or the state is to ensure that those rights and freedoms are protected and maintained for their citizens. In doing so, they reject a core principle expressed in that declaration, that our essential rights and freedoms come from the transcendent creator or God, and that no human institution or government can deny or abrogate them. With the current geopolitical threat of status regimes, as well as the rise of secular Marxist ideals in woke popular culture, democratic nations are struggling to secure the fundamental rights and freedoms of their citizens in addition to maintaining their fragile institutions. The sanctity of human life that comes from the creator, which has once been the bedrock of most Western democracies is now being challenged at home and abroad. These disturbing trends makes it even more important than ever for democracies to identify and acknowledge where true freedom and rights arise. It should be self-evident that without recognizing a transcendent source for these ideals, imperfect human beings and the institutions they create would inevitably abridge them for the sake of a greater collective purpose rooted in the almighty state. The founders of the United States and the authors of the Declaration clearly understood the limitations of humanity and its, and its institutions. They made it a point to counter the prevalent belief of the 18th century in the divine right of kings with the principle that unalienable rights and freedoms of all people come from the creator. In essence, 
the founders countered human claims to ultimate authority with that of God. This truth that fundamental freedoms and rights come from the sovereignty of God has endured the test of time and has allowed Western democracies to thrive. Without the acknowledgement of God's sovereignty as a source of fundamental rights and freedoms, serious problems arise. A good example is the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights that does not recognize the creator as a source of those rights due to its creation during the height of the Cold War. Consequently, the United Nations cannot deal effectively with authoritarian and status regimes that decide for themselves what rights and freedoms their subjects are allowed and what they are not allowed. The two Koreas represent the most extreme example of this confrontation between the democratic South and the status dictatorship in the North. The DPRK is a nuclear armed state whose leadership has sacrificed the well-being of its people to achieve that status. There is no doubt that they would use force to unite the peninsula, for they were the instigators of the Korean War in 1950. That technically still has not ended. Here, as well as on other fronts, geopolitical uncertainty has intensified, increasing the danger that a false step or miscalculation could lead to a major escalation in catastrophe. This is certainly true for North Korea, where the geopolitical situation is exacerbated by internal tensions. The regime has long sacrificed development for its idea of security, foisting extreme hardship and deprivation upon its people. As a result, there is a real danger of food shortages producing famine on a scale rival to the catastrophe of the mid-1990s. People in the DPRK today no longer live in a cocoon, however, with no information from the outside world. The current generation of North Koreans has experienced the freedom of, of enterprise and choice, however restricted, offered by the Changmadong, informal markets. They watch TV dramas from China and South Korea and do not accept the propaganda that, however harsh their lives might be, those of their southern brother are even worse. The regime fears the confluence of a more informed, less unconditionally loyal population with greater hardships. This is something that all of us need to be aware of, especially in the last several years when there was the potential of conflict between the DPRK and the United States. Who did the North Korean regime fear more in terms of a threat to them? Was it the United States threat of potential military conflict or was it an uprising amongst the North Korean people? The situation is very different from 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago. This is something that we have to keep in mind. Its reaction is typical of authoritarian regimes under pressure, enforcing tighter security at the border with China and cracking down on those accessing foreign media. When loyalty is replaced by fear and the general population suffers increasing hardship, the situation becomes unsustainable. Change is bound to come. We just don't know when or in what form it will happen. The Korean people today face two major challenges, unifying their divided homeland and rediscovering their Korean identity. The two are intertwined. Once we understand that unification is not just about the dealings of governments, but is the coming together of a separated people, 
then it becomes clear that a strong sense of Korean national identity for both Koreas is essential for the Korean people in the South and in the North to be able to reunite. That identity has been eroded in the North through 77 years of oppression and hardship, but it is also disappearing here in the South. After the devastation of the Korean War, a total national effort was invested into developing the economy and securing the country against another invasion. That produced remarkable prosperity, but we now see that it came at a significant cost. The Chebor system that originally drove growth has become a drag on fresh new entrepreneurial organizations and companies. Highly educated young people suffer debilitating unemployment and many can no longer even afford to get married. To navigate this uncertain future, a clear national purpose is essential, but has been tremendously lacking. To move beyond the stagnant, stagnant status quo, a new pro approach is needed with a broad vision and a movement to advance it. That vision, I believe, is the Korean dream. As I explain in my book of that title, to build our future, we need to learn from our past. Before the tragic 20th century, before the ideological conflict between communism and democracy and the bloody division it produced, Koreans shared a 5,000 year history as one homogeneous people with a common culture. That culture was rooted in ideals and principles that arose from the sp founding spirit of Tangun. Foremost among the, these were the ideals of Hongingan, living for the greater benefit of all mankind. From that very beginning of our history, the Korean people held to the moral vision that embraced all people. This was their providential mandate, and to fulfill it was their destiny. Throughout their history, Koreans have embraced different faith traditions that have come to this land, but our ancestors always digested those traditions and gave them a unique Korean character rooted in the Hongingan tradition. They recognized Hananim, one Lord or God above, whatever the variety of their religious expression. The Korean flag itself, the Taeguki, is a lesson in the principle that sustained the harmony of the universe. It is an example of the spiritual character inherent in the Korean people across their history. This is the shared heritage of all Koreans north and south, that transcends the current ideological, political, and national divisions. It is the route to which Koreans in both north and south must be reconnected to provide the vision and energy that can reunify a separated people. One of the clear distinctions of the GPF approach rooted in the Korean dream is the recognition of our shared history that has never been one of the components in the unification dialogue. And I cannot emphasize this enough. Arising from this history, the Korean dream promise is for a free and unified Korea, a new nation, in which the fundamental God-given rights of all people will be secured under the sovereignty of God. This resonates with the ideals of the 1919 Samuel independence movement. Certainly, they wanted to end Japanese colonial rule. But more than that, they sought to create a nation that lived up to the highest ideals. They even envisioned a free Korea working together with Japan for the benefit of the region and the world. Here was the spirit of Hongingan in action and the aspirations of the nation united around it. The end of World War II brought the end to Japanese colonial rule that we celebrate 
in August 15th, just two days from now. It also brought the opportunity to create a free and unified Korea, the Samuel independence movement had longed for. UN mandated elections were to be held in 1948 across the whole country, but they never happened. Despite visits by Korean leaders from the South to persuade Kim Il-sung to work with them for a united Korea, he and his Soviet sponsors at that time declined to hold elections in the North. They were held only in the South and shortly thereafter, two separate states were founded, a division that lasts till this day. The aspirations of the Samuel independence movement remained unfulfilled. The separation of the Korean people has persisted far too long. The current status quo cannot endure. The situation on the peninsula is the final remnant of the Cold War and a dark legacy of former colonialism. It is long past time to unify the peninsula, and the Korean dream is the way forward to forge a new and better future. The Korean dream can inspire and motivate Koreans in both South and the North to reconnect with their unique identity and heritage in order to take ownership over our common future. At the same time, it offers North Korea the prospect of becoming part of a united and independent nation that enjoys great prosperity as well as fundamental freedoms and rights. Most importantly, it will safeguard the Korean homeland from an increasingly aggressive and powerful China and Russia. Over the next three years, we will work to greatly expand the understanding and support for the Korean dream paradigm, both within Korea and internationally. This initiative already has significant momentum through Action for Korea United, an unprecedented coalition of nearly 1,000 civil society organizations working collaboratively to promote a free and unified Korea. Its education programs have been informing Korean professionals, organizations, opinion leaders, and civil society stakeholders across the social spectrum. The progress of its work will continue to accelerate in the coming years as it builds consensus around unification and the character of the new Korea that will emerge from it. We will build broad support in South Korea and the diaspora around a national vision for peaceful unification based upon the Korean dream. By 2025, the 80th anniversary of liberation, we will hold public rallies in towns and cities all over the South in support of a free and unified Korea, reminiscent of the Samil movement for independence more than 100 years ago. The Korean dream will galvanize the hearts of every Korean to realize our collective destiny and thus honor the legacy of our ancestors through seeing the hopes of our forefathers fulfilled. Such a powerful expression of solidarity behind a common vision led by the Korean people themselves instead of any government or political party will allow the South to bypass its hyper-partisan divide and let their brethren in the North know, know that they are not alone. And that, and that we as the Korean people can make what the world deems to be impossible a reality. Amen? This is also a very, another di distinction between the Korean dream paradigm and every other effort for unification. It's a bottom-up approach. This will be the expression of a truly bottom-up movement of the people beyond national and ideological divisions and thereby be a catalyst 
for a greater international recognition and support. I call upon every Korean everywhere, young and old, at home and abroad, to take ownership over the Korean dream and help this movement come to fruition. And for our foreign dignitary and friends, this is not just a call for Koreans, but all of you who believe in freedom and fundamental human rights and the need for a divided people to come together as one. The Korean dream is your dream, is your cause. Becoming the providential instruments in creating a new model nation from the ashes of a divided peninsula that guarantees freedom and human rights in the most consequential region in the world where statist powers are on the rise is something that you can stop by owning the Korean dream. Amen? In short, Korean unification will be the most monumental achievement for world peace and will spark the light of hope and possibility for the 21st century. In closing, let me remind you of, a prophetic, of the prophetic words of Chinggis Khan. And I know that our uh, Mongolian friend will uh, know this quote very well. He said, if one person has a dream, it is but a dream. But if everyone shares in that dream, it will become reality. Ladies and gentlemen, by each and every one of us owning the Korean dream as our own personal dream, let us realize the providential destiny of creating a new nation together as one Korean people. Then let us offer this new nation centered upon the sovereignty of God to the world and fulfill our providential mandate of living for the greater good of all mankind. Can you do this, yes or no? I can't hear you, can you do this, yes or no? Thank you very much. God bless you and your families. That was such an impressive speech. A big round of applause of gratitude and encouragement. So, only in that the spirit has been penetrating for 5,000 years by achieving Korean dream, we are to achieve the vision of unified Korean Peninsula. And uh, he actually asked for the participation of all leaders. So with a desire for a peaceful and unified uh, Korea, Dr. Hyun Jin Press Moon has been working so hard so far with Greg Hashin. Let us give him a big round of applause for gratitude and the encouragement. Another round of applause, please. Thank you. He gave us a vision of a unified Korean Peninsula and a roadmap that's needed. Thank you so much. We're going to have a photo session now. We don't have much space here at the podium. So all the speakers uh, from um, five tables will come forward to participate in the photo session. I ask for your understanding on that. So the leaders and the speakers from the front row, which is the five different tables, please participate in the photo session. Thank you.
I'd like to make a housekeeping announcement as we have a photo session. After the photo session, we are going to have a closing ceremony and also lunch will be provided uh, to your current tables. As you have your lunch, you'll be enjoying the performance and the show of Rainbow Choir. It is Korea's first choir of children from multicultural families in Korea. It has been active in many different occasions, um, including the 20th presidential um, inauguration of ceremony and the Roman Vatican and UN headquarters. So the choir has been very active at home and abroad. After the luncheon, the peace and security session will be held here from 1.30 p.m. I'd like to ask for your active participation and support. And on YouTube and Zoom at 8 o'clock tomorrow, today and tomorrow, our breakout sessions will be aired to 40 different countries around the world. So please tune in. As we dream together, we'll achieve a unification. When I say one dream, please raise your right hand, say, O oh, chant, one Korea. So all the people on the stage and outside the stage, please chant together. When I say one dream, please repeat after me, one Korea. One dream. Okay, I'll do it again. One dream. One Korea. Thank you. And we have another chant. Unification with our hands. When I say with the hands of citizens, you say with the hands of us. So unification through the hands of citizens and through the hands of our. Thank you. With this, we conclude the plenary session of International Forum on One Korea 2022 on the theme of Free and Unified Korea, a catalyst for regional and global peace and development. Let's conclude the session with a big round of applause. Thank you.